Good morning, South Point. Hi, I'm Kevin, and we're so glad that you're with us. Thanks so much for joining us on this beautiful and crisp Sunday morning. That's right. I'm Paula, and we are so glad that you're here. If you're watching us online right now, that means you have found our social media channels, and we are so glad. If you are watching from YouTube or Facebook or for the best experience, southpointforyou.com slash live, go ahead and give us a like and follow, and that way you can stay up to date on all the South Point happenings. Yes. You know, one of the five core values here at South Point Church is that Jesus Christ is a big deal. That's right. It's our number one core value. We even made a shirt about it. Jesus is a big deal. Uh, that just means Jesus is a big deal and life change can happen because God gave his best for us and we can give our best for him. And we can live lives that uh, reflect that every day uh, where we honor God, um, where he is worthy. We give him all of our submission. We give him all the glory and we live lives uh, every day that reflect who God is. Yes. Uh, Pastor Kyle will give us a wonderful message this morning on worship, where we will learn more about God, and it will help us get our week off to a wonderful start. And it's both practical yeah. and applicable. Yeah, I agree, Kevin. Uh, I just love that on Sundays we can come together, we can hear something that's practical and applicable for our week, get our week started off on the right foot. You know, if you're joining us online, whether you're at home or if you're traveling this week, uh, you are not alone. You're worshiping with us too and uh, with just uh, so many people all across the world today. And so just be encouraged and, uh, you know, it's just such an encouragement and we are really uh, just having such a great, a great time uh, worshiping God today. It's really bringing me a lot of joy. What's bringing you joy, Kevin? Paula, uh, the hope of this brand new day is what's bringing me joy right now. What about you guys out there? Go ahead and drop us a comment on what's bringing you joy on this day. And while you're at it, please go ahead and fill out the connect card that will pop up in the chat. Yes, thank you for filling out that Connect card. It gives us a record of your attendance. And in just a moment, we are going to join the worship team uh, to do some worship live. Uh, so let's join the worship team uh, now as we go live to the service. Friends, let's all stand to our feet and worship the Lord. We're so glad that you've taken time out of your Sunday to join us here at South Point Church. Whether you're here in the room or at home online, Thank you for joining us. Let's all spend some time together singing about how good our God is. There is a river where goodness flows. There is a fountain that drowns sorrows. There is a ocean deeper than fear. The tide is rising, rising. There is a current stirring deep inside. It's overflowing.
just that this morning.
able to worship freely, coming together as a community. Lord, touch Pastor Kyle, Lord, as he comes to render the word to us. Open up our hearts and minds to receive the word from you, God. Let Pastor um, Kyle decrease so that you may increase. Lord, thank you so much for your power and your grace and your mercy. We love you forever, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for worshiping with us. Humans have a long history of worship. Whether it's Buddha or Beyonce, Krishna or the Kardashians, John Lennon, Jesus, or the latest shiny device with a blue light screen, it seems that we all have a desire to adore, a magnetic pull towards the transcendent. So what is worship? When broken down, the word worship literally means worth-ship, worthiness, acknowledgement of worth. It's easy to assume that worship is something limited to Christians singing songs, Muslims on a pilgrimage, or Zen Buddhist monks meditating in mystical temples. But the truth is, we all ascribe worth to something. Our car, our personal appearance, celebrity culture, our favorite brands. When you really break it down, we are all worshipers. The only real question is, what are you worshiping? And is it really worth your worthship? Historically, people would worship the king of the land. If they were a good king, they were worthy of worship because they provided protection, governance, and life and prosperity to the people of their kingdom. People ascribed worth to the king's authority because they trusted the goodness of the king and were thankful for the peace and well-being that was provided living under his rule. In this sense, the opposite of worship could be described as mutiny. Mutiny, by definition, is an open rebellion against the proper authorities a revolution, an uprising, a resistance. What we're really talking about here is that worship and mutiny aren't merely actions, but are actually positions of the heart. Worship is a heart of gratitude that gives worth. Mutiny is a heart of rebellion that withholds worth. This leads us to the core of what it means for us to worship. You see, God designed the human heart with a will authorized with the power of choice to choose what we worship either to worship God because we trust His goodness and the life and well-being that He provides, or to rebel and decide for ourselves what will bring us life and well-being. And as history and human experience tells us, we choose mutiny. The Bible says we exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator. Put simply, if life had a control seat, we kicked God off. Who, me? and ultimately sat in it ourselves. But to worship God is exactly the opposite. It is to humble everything about ourselves and honor everything about Him. That's the way we were designed. That's what makes us come alive. Jesus is worthy of our worship. He created us and loves us unconditionally. He chose to die on the cross to take the penalty of death that we deserved because of our choices. He came alive again, and with Him in the control seat of our life, we experienced the best life we were designed to live. It's worth weighing up what you worship and whether it's giving you life or stealing your life. You don't have to worship Jesus. He's like a gentleman, and so He'll never force you to. That choice is yours. All right, well, hey guys, you came fired up and ready to go this morning, singing great, looking great, feeling good, and uh, just grateful that you'd be here this morning. I want to give a shout out to our friends in Theater 8 and uh, those joining us online on all the different flat platforms, uh, but at the end of the day, we are here as one church uh, to celebrate uh, the one who's worthy, and so that's what we're talking about today is, is this idea of worship. Now, we just came out of a series called Confessions of a Flawed Pastor, and so I'll start with a confession this morning. Uh, for the last week, I have worshipped at the altar of the Atlanta Braves. Now, if, if you're not a baseball fan, many aren't. They think it's too slow and, and boring. I'll catch you up. Uh, the Atlanta Braves are a young, scrappy team who had a terrible first half but caught fire in the second and uh, made it to the playoffs against the L.A. Dodgers. And the L.A. Dodgers are the best team money can buy. Boo. All right? And so we've been battling it out all week long in the National League Championship, which is right before 
uh, the World Series. And so uh, all week we've been listening to the pundits say, hey, they shouldn't be here. They're not going to make it. It's, it's not going to go well. Uh, we've stayed up late at night watching the games that have been on both coasts, you know, disregarding that it's a school night and a work night. Uh, we, we've uh, hung in there and, and celebrated these walk-off wins and consoled ourselves through some hard losses. Uh, we, we've gone to bed, falling asleep to the broadcast, and I, I wake up and that my initial first reflex is to reach for my phone, find out how the game ended, and let that decide if it's going to be a good day or a bad day. I don't know if you've ever done that before. Uh, I've chanted the names Freddie and Eddie and Ozzy with passion. Uh, I, I have whispered in hushed tones that sound like prayer for, for strikes and for bon uh, hits and runs. I've thought terrible things about umpires who are probably really nice guys, right? Uh, I prioritize my life around the schedule of a bunch of grown men playing a game. I've worshipped at the altar of the Atlanta Braves, but they won, so hey, it's worth it. All right. But let's just say this. Worship isn't exclusively religious. We, we all do it. We all give our worship away. Uh, maybe you, you've seen this uh, where we've given our attention, our affection, our adoration away to something that isn't God, and, and it, just, it just is a natural response of the human heart. Uh, maybe you've been to a big concert, Tens of thousands of fans packed into the arena. You know, they joked about Beyonce in the video or, or Taylor Swift or Ed Sheeran, whoever it is. Before the artist hits the stage, there's this moment of just excitement and anticipation that as soon as the lights come on and the first notes hit, well, hands go in the air, don't they? Like, they, the hands go in the air because there's, there's this majesty of like a shared experience that uh, isn't necessarily uh, religious. Or maybe you've seen worship in the office uh, where, where we lay our lives down to climb the ladder, the corporate ladder, the stairway to heaven, as it were. And, and, uh, and we, we lay our lives down for these quotas and, and projections and goals. And, and we confuse productivity with significance. Maybe you've seen it, you've seen worship in relationships where we give more and more and more of ourselves away to be conformed into whatever it is that the other person wants. And, and, and we, we let them determine uh, who we are and what brings value. And the reality is their, their demands and expectations will never be fully satisfied. We've certainly seen uh, worship, distorted worship, in our two-party political system. As people dig in on ideological sides and trenches and, and uh, slingshots against the other, redefining who our enemy is and, and what terms that, that used to be clear like truth and justice in the American way. We're, we're worshiping through politics. And so I just want to take a few minutes today, and I want to do two things. First, I want to recenter our worship. I want to recenter our worship on Jesus uh, because he is worthy, and, and not because sports fanaticism or relational pursuits or professional success or political activism is bad or wrong. It, it's not. It's just unfulfilling. It's their unsatisfying objects of worship. And, and the best that horizontal worship can do is point us to this reality that it will never satisfy us and that only vertical worship towards our Heavenly Father can satisfy. And so that's why it's been said that the chief end of man is to love God and to enjoy Him forever. That at the end of the day, everything that we do points to that idea that we're to enjoy and to love God and so I want to recenter our worship on that. I, I want to recenter our, our focus, our, our attention and affection and direction towards Jesus. And so if you forget what I'm talking about, it's, it's basically this. You can just look at my t-shirt and go like, oh, that's right. That's what we're talking about. Jesus is bigger than Sunday because we want to make this confession and, and, and get our worship Recentered, but then we want to export it out of the building. Uh, we believe that, that worship isn't intended just to, to encourage us in this moment, uh, but it's actually to equip us, to send us out into the world around us. And, and so if our, if our worship doesn't lead us to love God and love our neighbor, then we're doing it wrong. If it doesn't cause us to love Jesus and love justice, then we're doing it wrong because there, there needs to be a recentering and then a going with our worship. Uh, now, to, to, to get worship out of the building, we've got to expand our definition, right? Because if I were to ask you what worship is, you might say it's what we just did for the last 10 to 15 minutes, right? We, we sang worship songs in a worship service. Uh, 
But, but that's not it. That's not the complete picture. I love musical worship. I love to lead worship. I crank it up in my car. It's in my playlist at work. Right? I, just, I, I personally connect to God through musical worship. But that's only one definition. And, and so uh, we're going to look today at the words of Jesus, right? Because I think his, his words matter most. That, that worship can't be reduced to what we sing and what we say on Sunday. And we're going to pick it up in Matthew 15, where Jesus is talking to and about the Pharisees. And, and the Pharisees are the religious leaders of the day. Um, they are the ones that had it all together. And, uh, you know, Jesus, again, talks about them and to them right in front of them in uh, Matthew 15, where he says this, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is is a farce because they teach man-made ideas as commands of God. And you know, just to stop and go, that is, that is harsh. Because if you were to look at these guys, uh, they probably were doing a lot more good uh, or, or had a lot more right than they had wrong. Uh, they, they looked the part. They, they did the right thing. And yet Jesus identifies that something's missing in their worship. And, and in fact, that, that what was happening on the outside was secondary to what was happening on the inside. And that what was happening on the inside could actually negate what was happening on the outside. So it didn't matter how it looked. And so when we're going to recenter our worship, we have to start with this simple principle, uh, which is this, that the inside is more important than the outside, right? You got to look where the Pac-Man's going to eat. And that, that's the bigger deal, right? So the inside is the bigger deal than the outside. Uh, and this would have been so offensive to suggest to these guys that their worship was incomplete or incompatible with God. Because they were the, the public image of what it means to, to be a follower of God in that time. How they dressed, how they ate, how they spent their money, um, how they stayed ceremonially clean. Uh, it was all in an effort to strive after and to worship God. A and yet God looks at that and says uh, that, that that's not it. And he reminds us that while, while man looks at the outward appearance, God has always been after the heart. And so to dig into this a little, a little deeper, it's to say that our inner worship is more important than our outer works. And we focus a lot on, on works and doing good things. And, and yes, we want to be about the Father's business, but uh, we have to start with this place of internal uh, retrospection to, to go, is what's happening on the inside? Is my, is my internal worship informing my outer works? Uh, A.W. Tozer is a, a theologian and pastor and did a lot of uh, books on, on worship and, and knowing God. And he said this about the, the, the line here. He says, God wants worshipers before workers. Indeed, the only acceptable workers are those who have learned the lost art of worship. And so again, he's just drilling into this idea that it starts from the inside. Jesus expands on this in John chapter 4. And uh, th this passage is the, the woman at the well, which you've probably heard about many times in uh, there's a lot that we could unpack here about her story, about why Jesus chose to engage her, but that's not where we're going today. We're going to skip the scandalous part of the story and just get to the, to the end conversation that really centers around this idea of, of internal worship and coming to God uh, from the inside out. And uh, she's talking to Jesus and she basically says, hey, uh, you know, worshiping God has always been about being in the right place with the right people. And uh, Jesus says this in verse 23, a time is coming and indeed is here now when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. The father is looking for those who will worship him that way for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship how in spirit and in truth. And so uh, you probably heard this passage before, right? Uh, that the woman is talking about how for, for all of time, uh, you had to go to the high and holy places to worship. You went to holy places with holy people and did holy rituals. And Jesus was saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to bring a whole different way. Uh, that's how it used to happen, but that's not the way it's going to happen. From now on, it's not about holy places. It's about holy souls. And so have you ever considered what it, what it means to worship in spirit and in truth? Uh, to, to worship in spirit, first, it, it's kind of obvious, but maybe not is that when we worship in spirit, uh, it is the connection between your inner spirit and the Holy Spirit, right? So the invisible connection between every believer on earth and the God of the universe, it happens internally through our spirits. 
And so what gets activated in worship, whether it's musical worship or worship through serving, worship through teaching, worship uh, through, through praying, what gets activated between you and God is always first internal. And that might trigger a physical response. Your heartbeat might pick up and it starts pounding and, and your, your physical and spiritual posture uh, soften as you begin to recognize the presence of God. Your emotions engage with what's going on. Uh, but all of that happens before anything happens externally. It, it happens inwardly. The secondly it, it is truth. And what does it mean to worship in truth? This really has to do, again, with our minds still inside the body, right? That, that we see God and understand God truly for who he is. And that means I let God define himself, that, that I believe God is who he says he is as revealed in the scriptures, not in my circumstances and not in my feelings. Because if we waited to worship until we felt it, uh, we'd be waiting a long time, right? And, and so uh, when, we, when we set our mind on things above, and we remember uh, that God is holy and righteous and other, that he is full of power and strength and beauty and greatness and goodness. And if, we, if I were to go around the room and let everybody choose an adjective and everybody online, we'd have hundreds of words to describe our God, and yet we would only be scratching the surface, right? And so this is who our God is. And, and I don't know about you, but I can be too casual with that God, right? Like I can just... I can just lean into him and to, to direct my attention and just start running off my list of, of needs and wants and hopes without recognizing that I'm talking to the God of the universe. And so what happens is over time, my view of God shrinks. And, and, and when that happens, I start to ask questions and, and use a tone with him that sounds like, like I have the, the wisdom or the counsel to, to give to God, right? Like, like somehow... I want to defend God and be like, hey, God, have you looked around here lately? Because it's not going so great. And you should see what people are saying about you and what they think. You, know, you should probably do something about that. And, and, and yet when I have a clear view of God and I see him for who he is and the greatness of his understanding, then my questions get, get small and my demands uh, become few because I'm reminded that there will be a day when I'm welcomed into heaven, but there will never be a day where God answers to me. There will be a day when I answer to God, and he'll ask me, what did you do to feed the poor? What did you do to clothe those who need it? What did you do to visit the prisoner uh, or to care for the foreigner? And so again, when we, when we see God clearly, then we're able to worship him truly. And so there's, there's time to jump and dance and shout. I love our opening songs because we get to like come in and get excited and fired up. But there's also a time to just shut it down, and to recognize that God is God, that he is who he says he is. And so uh, I think that's, that's why uh, Solomon, the, the, the wisest man who ever lived, he said this about coming into the house of God. He said, uh, as you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut, for it is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Don't make rash promises. Don't be hasty in bringing your matters before God. After all, God is in heaven and you are here on earth. So let your words be few. And so I want to take a minute to do something different today because I think in, in, in the world that we live in, it's so fast-paced and so energetic. And it's, it's really, you know, we understand this idea of, of relationship and communication with God. But sometimes we just need to have some silence. That, that what's actually sacred is not what we offer to God, but sometimes just being silent in his presence. And so we're going to take an actual minute, a whole 60 seconds, and just stand silent. We're not going to pray. We're not going to tell God how great he is. We're just going to acknowledge the greatness of God. We're going to acknowledge that in this room is the fullness uh, of the creator of the world, the God who gives and takes away, the God who gives life and breath. We're going to recognize that he is the God who, who stands over time and eternity and civilizations, and that he's a big God and that we're not. And we're going to let our words be few. We're going to do our best to create a sacred moment. And if you're joining us online, that might be hard. You're, you're there wrangling kids and making breakfast. And um, uh, just we're going to do our best to create a sacred moment of silence and to let God speak to us um, or just be 
quiet in his presence. And remember that our God is a consuming fire. So let's just go and be quiet for one moment. Therefore, let us offer to Jesus, offer through Jesus, a continual sacrifice of praise, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. See, it's, it's, it's easy to sing and to shout, but sometimes just to sit in silence is to worship God. And, and so whether it's through silence or through our, our words, we want to offer a continual sacrifice of praise to God because worship isn't an event. Worship doesn't happen Sunday at 9 and 11. Uh, worship isn't something that's intended for an hour. It's intended for, for every hour. And so the, the writer here invites us to a continual sacrifice of praise, day by day, moment by moment, realigning and recommitting and pledging allegiance to his name, to Jesus' name, his reputation, his finished work. Because what happens if we don't do this? What happens if we don't give a continued uh, praise? The answer is we're going to give it away to some lesser God. Because we're full of worship and it's got to come out. And it's going to come out somewhere. And we're going to give it to someone else. So have you ever noticed this, that you become like who you worship? Right? You, you dress like them, you talk like them, you imitate their tone and their buzzwords. Uh, you you want to go where they go and do what they do, right? And so people have always, through all of human history, there's been leaders and followers. And, and in each generation, it looks different. And in this generation, I think it's most uh, easily defined by, by this newer term in the last 10 years. It's, it's what all the kids want to be when they grow up. Not sports stars or pop stars or police officers. They want to be an influencer, Right? They want to be a YouTube or Instagram or whatever cool social media the kids are on these days. They want to be an influencer. And if you're not familiar with that term, uh, the concept is this, that, that uh, there are people who share enough of their lives online where you go, oh, they're just like me, right? And, and I like them and, and I trust them and I value their opinion. And when that happens, once that happens, they can sell you anything. And, and so the same people will sell you makeup and, and computers and vacations and, uh, you know, raise funds for their charity or their nonprofit. Uh, because when we, when we uh, worship someone, we want to be like them and we want to have what they have. And so a lot of times these are good people. They're not, they're not bad and evil people. But there's obvious limitations to this. There's obvious downfalls to even the best of people. That when we, when we worship uh, broken and fallen and imperfect people, we eventually end up disappointed and used, right? Because sure, they, they, they may care about you, but you're, you're further down the list than their own uh, interests. And, and so when we become like them, uh, there's some benefit, but there's a limit and we end up feeling disappointed and used. Now, on the other side, when we give our worship, our attention, our affection, our adoration, uh, our, our, our worth, and value to the God of the Bible, when we, when we put our hope and our faith in Jesus, we're never disappointed and we're never used because Jesus has already given us all things, right? He's, he's already given everything for us. So what could he want from us? And, and so uh, when, we, when we follow Jesus, our character and our desire and our will becomes like the God that we serve. And so if God, if Jesus is, is peace and goodness and love and joy, uh, that is who we become. And so said simply, I'm not sure if we got there yet. You become what you worship. 
You become what you worship. And so I have to ask, do you like who you're becoming? Because it comes from this place. Verse 16 says, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices of God. And so I want to be really clear that, again, the initial spiritual transaction that happens in worship is always inward. It's always within the heart, the mind, the soul of the person. Uh, You can't outwardly respond your way into inward worship. It just doesn't work that way. And somebody needs to hear this uh, because you've been trying to bring back that love and feeling that's gone, 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 right? And you're here on Sundays and you're hoping that the, the worship team will sing something or the pastor will say something that lights that fire again in you and that, that gets you your warm fuzzies. But true worship, it, it always begins from the inside out. It, it requires us to, to surrender our demands and our expectations. And so we can't outwardly express our way into inward worship. But the second half of worship is always a response. There's always a response. When we encounter the living God, uh, there's always a response. And that response isn't just warm and happy feelings. It's not just increased levels of, of happy chemicals in our brain. It should motivate us to love Jesus and to, to translate that into our homes, in our workplace, in our community, and even the world. And so it's interesting that the writer associates here praising God with doing good to those in need, right? There's a connection between our worship and our works. But here's the thing. He also throws in a a don't forget, right? We see the don't forget there. And it's as if it's possible to have an encounter with God where we have this this, uh, surge of obedience and we're like, yes, God, whatever you say to the ends of the world, here we go, right? Okay, okay, we'll start with our community and we say yes to something on Sunday, right? And we say, okay, we're going to serve our community in the after-school program or, or the homeless shelter or sign up for a Sunday morning team here on Sunday uh, or at church. Uh, but just a day or two later, we forgot about that feeling, right? And it's because obedience leaks. It, it comes out before we have a chance to respond to it. And, and so I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It certainly happened to me. And so to, to drill down into the idea of, of continued obedience, of constant worship, we're going to look at Romans 12, where Paul says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is how you do it. And do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here the Apostle Paul, he's calling us to a full cycle of worship, that in view of God's mercy, in view of of what God has done for you in the past, that's Jesus, right? His saving grace. In view of what God is doing for you in the present, he's sustaining you by his grace. Uh, When we think about our future, that this isn't the end, and that we will worship God forever, Uh, in heaven. That's future grace. When we think about that in view of God's mercy, our only response, our only proper response is worship, to recognize the worthiness and the value and the supremacy of our God, and then to join him in his mission. Paul contrasts only two binary options. We have to choose one, to either be conformed to this world or transformed by the renewing of our minds. To to be conformed by the world is to be conformed from the outside in, to to worry about the aesthetics, to worry about how it looks before how it actually is. Uh, To to be conformed to the world is to to be conformed to the predictable, destructive patterns, to just be like everyone else. The other opportunity is to be transformed from the inside out, for our minds to be transformed through Jesus, and then for that to go out into the world. And what happens there is it says that we would know the will of God, his good, pleasing, and perfect way. And so when we give our lives as a living sacrifice, worship becomes more than just what we sing and what we say. It becomes our whole life. So worship, uh, our, our work becomes worship. Our parenting becomes worship. And so this idea of continually praising God, of, of being 
consistently laying our lives in as a living sacrifice is the reason that we're here this morning. It's the reason that we do church, right? It's the reason that we have a thing called uh, worship services where every Sunday we show up uh, to engage God. And uh, th- this idea of worship is the reason that people show up at six, dozens of people, I don't know if you know this, dozens of people show up at 6 a.m. to make all of this happen. So that you can be here in this room and, and over in Auditorium 8 and, and be online. And so our kids can learn about the same Jesus, that he knows them and loves them and created them and wants to be their friend. And that our friends online can have a spiritual community of faith. Uh, we do this every week to create what's called a rhythm of remembrance. That, that when we would come back and remember who our God is. Because as we wrap up, I want to just simply define worship as this. To, to worship is to remember. Uh, my, my morning devotional, the author often refers to himself as a spiritual amnesiac, uh, which means that he forgets, you know, what God has done, is doing, and will do. And that just feels super familiar to me of like, yep, I forgot again. And so uh, we need rhythms of remembrance. And so we show up here on Sunday. And, and we gather and we sing songs of hope and praise and we, and we hear words of encouragement and challenge from the scriptures. And then hopefully we go out from here and continue to worship uh, throughout the week. And so friends, I, I hope that church isn't just one more thing you have to do on the weekend. I hope it's not a box that you check. I, I hope it's central to a weekly rhythm of remembering, uh, to remember the goodness of God and to remember and to, to bring it into light, into view, God's mercies. So this week I learned that the opposite of the word remember is not forget, it's to dismember. It's that, the idea that, that things that are whole get separated from the body, from the whole. And, and so as we remember Jesus through our worship, he's, he's literally bringing us back to wholeness. He's bringing back our drifted thoughts and our, and our distorted views. Uh, he, he is bringing back uh, our, our, our broken uh, doubts and fears and reminding us of the goodness of God. He is putting Humpty Dumpty back together again as we remember. He remembers us from dismembered and disconnected bodies. And, and so when we're off course, he invites us to come back home to the wholeness that, that we were made for. And so we're going we're gonna to end the service today in a moment of musical worship. And as, as the team comes, I want to invite you to remember, uh, friends who follow Jesus, I want you to remember a time when you knew that your spirit was visiting with God's spirit. Uh, when, when there was a moment where there was an exchange happening inside of you uh, where, where your physical, spiritual, and emotional self combined and gave worship from the inside out. Um, and, and I'll be honest, for, for some of us, it's going to be a while back. Um, it's been a hard season. It's been a hard season for me. Like I, I, my, my spiritual and emotional senses uh, are dull. And um, I, I find myself on, on some days, uh, you know, feeling frustrated and disconnected and hard-hearted. And, and so sometimes we just need to be reminded of the delight of worshiping Jesus. And so we're going to lean in with anticipation and remember all he's done, all he's doing, and all he will do. And just allow ourselves to, to be in the presence of God, to, to be renewed and refreshed by God, God's presence. And it may be for you, uh, you're a follower of Jesus, but you're not sure what that is and, and what that means and if that's ever happened for you. And, and so again, I just want to invite you to think from the inside out. That a lot of times you think, how do I, how do I stand? How do I sing? What do I do in order to engage God? And, and sometimes we just need to hit pause on that and just go, okay, from the inside out, my inner being is going to connect with God. And then lastly, I'd say this, that there are some of you who aren't even sure about Jesus. And you're like, man, this guy's talking about worshiping and I'm not even sure, you know, what, what that's about. And yet, as I talk about this idea that, that when we give our attention and our affection um, and our adoration, our awe to, to a person, we end up hurt and abandoned and used, and and you can see that in your own story. And and so today I'd invite you to redirect that that worship uh, to Jesus, who is able to handle the the weight of our worship and is worthy of everything that we have. 
And so as the, the, the team comes up, uh, I want to invite us all to imagine and to, to visualize this idea of being remembered and being brought back into wholeness with God. As we together confess that Jesus is the only one who lived and died and rose again. He's the only one uh, who is worthy of our adoration. Then we put our faith and our belief in him. We commit to follow him. And then we join him in the mission here on the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, as we head into a time of musical worship, uh, we're reminded that, that uh, it, it doesn't define our worship. That worship is when we uh, internally and externally bow before you and lay whatever worth and value we have onto you and say, you alone are worthy of glory and honor and power and praise. And we join all of creation uh, that worships you. We join all of heaven uh, that right now in your presence, the throngs are singing a holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who was and is and is to come. And we get the privilege uh, to join in that for our inner being to connect with your inner being and then to go out of here changed and excited about the mission that you've given. And so we're going to stand and worship you with all we've got. In Jesus' name, amen. The gospel of Jesus It's the hope of the ages Burning brighter and brighter and standing forever the church he is building nothing can stop it it's a city that's shining a light in the darkness nothing can stop it
thank you, worship team, for reminding us that God is with us. And thank you, Pastor Kyle, for the great reminder that Jesus Christ is bigger than Sunday. That's right. He certainly is. Hey, friends, I want to let you know about a new opportunity that we have coming up this week. On Tuesday, we're beginning a new online small group all about finances. Uh, If you have heard us talk about I was broke, now I'm not before, this is a great opportunity to just uh, learn more about biblical approaches uh, to um, using your your money and your resources. And it's about a six-week class. It's going to be online, as I said. And so if you are interested and want to sign up for that, you can go to southpointforyou.com slash finance. I can highly encourage it, uh, this group. You won't want to miss it. It's it's a really good one and an area where we can all use some help. All right. And speaking of finances, I just want to say thank you so much to all those who continue to give uh, so that the work of South Point Church can uh, continue. Uh, we can serve and love our community. We are building our new building. And so what you do and how you give is so important. To give now, go to southpointforyou.com slash give. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out via social media or call or text at 240-925-8787. And remember, you matter matter deeply deeply to to God. God. Have a great Sunday, everyone.